Donahue from Central Connecticut State University. I'm here with Gabe Lomas. Gabe, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Gabe Lomas. I am a professor at uh, Western Connecticut State University. I also chair the regional crisis team. It's a collaboration of about 12 different school districts in the western part of the state, and we work together to, to help each other during crisis situations. That's great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I know people will be um, joining in and as Michelle said, this PowerPoint will be made available to you um, as uh, <clears throat> um, after the um, presentation. I am going to um, just uh, start uh, the recording uh, um, point. I just want to thank you for you and Gabe for doing this and I know you reached out with this idea and it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, for us to learn from you, the experts, about how we can appropriately respond. So thank you very much for doing this. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks. And, and we really, um, you know, Gabe and I really want to open up a conversation um, today. This is, uh, we have some, some slides to share and we asked for an extra half an hour so that um, we had some time at the end, as much time as possible for people to share ideas. I think that's been one of the biggest benefits of the um, virtual roundtables that Cisco has put together um, since the beginning of the crisis. And I've been so appreciative and I, I really want to welcome everyone. Um, if you didn't get to announce yourself in the chat box, go ahead and do that. Um, Gabe and I have some things we're going to run through and um, you can either put your questions in the chat box, your resources in the chat box, um, or you can um, hold on to your questions um, to the end. Um, so we're, we're going to go till 2.30. Um, so Gabe introduced himself um, uh, by way of introduction um, of myself. Um, I was a school counselor um, for 16 years, two in um, the San Francisco Bay Area and 14 here in Old Saber, Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> I'm on the faculty at Central, where I'm the coordinator of the school counseling program. I'm very proud to have many of my school counseling students, um, current and former, um, here. So I'm happy to, to um, I think this is an important learning experience here for all of us. Um, crisis is opportunity. So um, that is the spirit in which uh, Gabe and I approached um, Siska about putting some things together. So. Um, we'll, we'll share some ideas, and I know that you have a lot to share because you're out there supporting kids and families right now, and thank you for all that you do. So we wanted to start with sort of what the purpose was, and we want to give you guys some practical recommendations. We want to hear the practical things you're doing, talking about the complex mental health needs of students, um, adults, the teachers we're working with in the wake of COVID-19. So we have this new normal that we're all trying to um, <clears throat> get used to on a family level, on a personal level, on a professional level. Um, and I don't know about you, but I have some good days and not so good days. Um, I'm so thankful um, for my family and for my team at CCSU and, and certainly for my students. So I know we're all um, leaning on the folks that are important to us right now in our new normal. <laughs> One of the things that, um, that I've been doing for self-care is I've been um, listening to Brene Brown's um, podcast. And today she was talking, the one I listened to today, she was talking about calm. So I thought I'd share this with you and her definition yeah, of calm is so important. Um, and that is the daily practice of creating perspective and mindfulness while managing our emotional reactivity. So calm is so important right now and i'm just inviting calm as i get started here and inviting calm for you as you um, make time to focus on crisis response right now so thank you so much for making that your focus right now <clears throat> um so one of the things um gabe and i talked about first was the need to kind of pull out your crisis plan um, and, and think about it with the lens of what's going on right now. So you have a plan in place. What would you be doing if we were in school regularly? And then to lean into that team approach. Um, so coming together, talking about scenarios, talking about um, you know, resources that you have. And we're gonna go through a lot of those things. I wanted to share that I, I spoke to a neighbor um, uh, the other day who is a critical care nurse at LNM and she's been reassigned from surgery to um, the COVID um, ward or the COVID um, uh, unit and 
she said one of the hardest things about it is that she's not with her regular team. She's not with the people that she addresses crisis with, who she works with, who's got, who she knows has her back. And as I was driving away from her house, um, I was thinking about the fact that, um, that we're so fortunate as school counselors to have our team together. And um, maybe we're bringing in our retired folks, which is lovely to hear about. And maybe we've got um, school counseling uh, practicum and internship students who are helping us from, from the wings right now because they can't do direct service. But we've got our team and we've got people who've got our back. So um, revisiting that uh, crisis plan and looking at it through the lens of how do we do this given um, our current reality is so important. So the things we're going to be sharing today um, are not kind of blanket statements of what everyone should be doing, um, but it's sort of, um, you have your site specific plan, you know your, your um, population in your school, you know um, what is going to be best for your, um, your community. Um, so we're just inviting some conversations and, and trying to put some resources out there. As always, Gabe and I want to um, invite you to put on your own oxygen mask first. Um, and I hope that you're practicing self-care every day, going outside on a beautiful day like it is here in Connecticut, um, you know, being um, present with your families, um, reaching out for support when you need it um, is so important. So um, I know that's a big thing we focus on um, in our school counseling program. I know Siska has provided some awesome opportunities for self-care. So it's worth starting out with that. Um, so when we look at the map of Connecticut and we think about how COVID-19 is unfolding here and, and for our folks who are um, uh, coming to us from other states, th this kind of data is, um, is available um, through the Department of, of Health in, in most states. And I encourage you to look at it because the way this crisis looks in some corners of Connecticut looks very different. And of course, all of our communities closest to New York um, have, um, you know, our heart is there with you and we're thinking about you. And there's always already been significant loss of life in that area. And um, we're, we're, we're praying for you and, and certainly um, hopeful that we can be helpful to you. And hopefully we can talk about ways that as we look at this map, um, communities that are less impacted can partner with the more impacted communities. Um, I know that <clears throat> I was, I want to give a shout out to Todd Dyer, who was talking about activating our um, director school counseling um, roundtable community and think about how those directors can partner up. And we'll be talking about um, the buddy system. Um, it's always a good way to get through most things, um, the buddy system. And then um, you know, how we can um, sort of look at that data and look at how, how we can be helpful. Um, it, it feels good to be helpful to other communities, um, certainly being mindful of what our community needs as well, um, but certainly we can, we can look at that. Um, so as we look at how COVID is unfolding in um, Connecticut, we're looking at our different um, counties and when this peak of hospitalizations um, uh, are going to be taking place. And this is, this is kind of a moving uh, crisis here. So as we think about the support to Fairfield County, that's forefront in our mind, New Haven, and then Hartford um, out here in Eastern Connecticut, um, we, uh, our, our curve is a little bit flatter because our population isn't as densely um, uh, arranged. And, and so that's one of those things that as we look at this kind of information and look at our resources and how we help each other out, um, uh, you know, Gabe and I are happy to be resources to um, your communities. And um, this just is helpful information. Um, the link is below as you can see it. So again, this is going to peak and we are going to see uh, the other side of things. Um, so we wanted to, to share that information. This graph is harder to look at, but important for us to, to be mindful of. Um, and that is that um, the project, projection is that um, we will lose um, over 1,100 um, residents of Connecticut um, by August 4th, if the projection is um, true to form. Um, and I think this is just as we walk into this conversation about crisis preparedness and crisis response, um, this is just something for us to be to be mindful of and aware of that the ripple effect, um, we can all think about a school year where we lost one or two individuals or maybe a small group of teenagers in a, um, in a car accident. Um, 
the, the ripple effect and the, the number of lives that they touch is always very significant. So we want to think about how do we how do we support kids and families um, uh, in this in this really um, challenging time. I'm going to hand it over to Gabe. Um, he does lots and lots of this kind of training with large groups, so he's got some great stuff to share with us. So I'll pass it over to, Dave, to Gabe. Thanks. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Just make sure. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Okay. I think sometimes we wonder about oh, what 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 specific skills do I need? How do I handle things differently? And I just want to reassure you that those counseling skills that you learn in, in your master's and doctoral program are the same skills that you're going to have to tap into today. Um, so just with with the, as with school-based counseling, crisis response counseling is not psychotherapy. It's designed just to help the the environment return back to this higher level of functioning. That's the core principle of crisis response: is we're not there for therapy, we're there for just to, to restore the environment. And and really, what we want to do is we want to identify coping skills that help students and families find ways to cope with what's going on now. It's important to normalize reactions to let people know that that having fear or uh, confusion about the current situation is, is normal, that's okay. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we all have, have those same reactions. Um, validating the feelings and, and then considering any practical assistance. And that's why it's good for you guys who are on this call now to uh, connect with your local state and county governments and make sure that you're aware of what, what potential resources are out there for assistance. I mean, we're, we're good at this already, but make sure that you're offering comfort and empathy using your listening skills that you've gotten through your graduate program. Um, insurance, insure problem solving, you know, try to help people talk through how they can, how they can find any ways of being and they can cope with, with stressors and any other kind of informational pieces that would be helpful um, to connect people to resources. Right, next, next slide. So you guys are welcome to put comments in the chat box too, and we'll try to get to them at the end. <laughs> if we go back to the prior slide, Meg. Sorry. There we go. That's okay. I think that this is important. Like this, that we're kind of going into a new frontier. We haven't really had a pandemic like this that's impacted us so significantly. So looking back at literature, we saw with the SARS uh, outbreak in Hong Kong. There was a study done here that I'm citing, and um, the study gives us really good information to help us think about how we're going to handle um, this situation. Um, so first off, we should anticipate that students and families are going to have heightened anxiety and stress, and you're probably seeing that as a connection with them already. Now, if we compare what we're seeing now to SARS, about two-thirds of the people in the SARS study expressed being helpless, horrified, apprehensive, in and then we had a subset of those who had some mental deterioration. And um, so we had about 16% of respondents that would be um, uh, eligible as, as uh, having post-traumatic stress uh, symptoms. So can I, can, I, can I interject for a moment? I'm getting a couple of messages on the chat that it's difficult to hear you. It sounds sort of muffled. Is there um, any kind of setting that, that might support um, it being clearer? Can you hear us okay, Gabe? How about now, Gabe? Is it coming in now? Yeah, I think that's better. Is that better, everybody? Uh, that's better, I think. Okay, good, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I was using earbuds before to try to drown out noise at my house, so <laughs> apologize. I so, think that's better, thanks. Okay, yeah, I'm using the computer's microphone now, so hopefully that's good for everybody. So I was talking about this slide comparing COVID-19 to SARS, and you can see that that, that um, from the pandemic experience from research, it shows that people are going to have uh, stress reactions and they're going to have uh, a small subset will have post-traumatic stress responses. And then we know that we need to have tap into resiliency and think about like, what are those variables for resiliency? Now in general, you guys are, should be right on this, but I just want to remind you, if, if Peg, you can go to the next slide, we can see that, um, that some factors that we find in resiliency are physical health. Now that is gonna be undermined if somebody is sick right now. 
you know, our physical abilities, uh, one's IQ, adaptive behavior, education, spirituality. So these are the things that we want to point people to when they need to, to find coping skills. And then these are also things that we should be thinking about in your student population, you know, which students are struggling the most um, and how, uh, what, what is your population? Do you have a large number of kids who have emotional disabilities or, or physical disabilities? And so are their coping skills strong or are they struggling? So those are the kids you wanna kind of keep at the top of our radar. Okay, Peg. So, I mean, I, I put this uh, image here on the, on the left hand side with the bookends because that's really what happens in a crisis situation. Normally we have normal functioning and all of a sudden you have a crisis occurs and then you have disaster and then you have another bookend to close it off. This is not like that at all. There's no bookends for us. It sort of is happening organically. We're at the beginning stages of it right now and it's really hard to see the other side of it. So it's hard to sort of say we have a start and we have a finish. We have a beginning and an end. And in fact, there's, it's possible that this thing will continue on. We, we may never have a real clo good closure for it. So that's, what, that's one of the key points that makes this even more challenging is that we don't have a beginning and an ending time. I mean, typically there's also a clear populations of, of victims and survivors and, and family members to support. And in this situation, it's not always real clear like who's been affected um, you know, because it's spread out all over the nation and then victims, you know, pop up and some of them, you know, are not so, so um, uh, sickened. So it's really hard to identify our population. Um, typically, we have, you know, natural disasters, man-made disasters, terrorism, there's those, the bookend experience. And with this one, we really can't have the bookends. And, and to some degree, even the helping professionals, we're taking precautions, but we're, we're vulnerable too. And if you remember back to your basic educational psychology with Maslow's hierarchy, you know, we have at the foundation, we have safety. And right now, we can't promise safety. You know, that's one of the key things is when you as a second responder go into a situation and you say, we're here to support now, you're safe. That's one of the, the trademark terms to tell someone you're safe now. But we, it's hard for us to promise safety at this point because it's still evolving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Peg. So sometimes with, some, with those reactions, we end up having people have, having sociogenic and psychogenic il illnesses. Those are medically unexplained physical reactions. So, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a normal human experience. Sometimes somebody begins to feel like they have some chest pain, some coughing, and then they begin to associate themselves with the symptoms. That, you know, it, it, can, it can lead to panic and it can lead to, um, to spikes in healthcare seeking behavior. So that makes it challenging for, for us to know like, you know, who's really sick. It's, it makes it really challenging for healthcare providers too to know like who's really sick and who should we be treating and you don't want to overlook somebody. And so that's something to think about, you know, with, the, with your population, with your students and your parents, like, you know, who, who might be experiencing this kind of um, 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 symptomology and then thinking about um, their behavioral responses. So like for panic, we sometimes see people trying to hoard things and then uh, which is happening already, right? And then we also see sometimes uh, people get aggressive too. Like uh, if they feel like that there's scarce resources, then sometimes they will try to get aggressive to try to obtain resources. So those are things to think about too, as you're working with student populations, especially in urban settings where there is more of a, of, of a, <clears throat> of a risk of um, people um, having scarce resources uh, and potential violence as well. Um, and then we've got to think about the vulnerable populations too. So in the middle of that pyramid, we've got um, kids with disabilities and children in general, they're, they're considered protected vulnerable uh, uh, populations, senior citizens who, are, who may be living at home with, uh, with, the, with these kids. And then you've got also the potential for partner violence. And then you've got these three different forces that press up against that, the proximity of an offender, the proximity of a vulnerable you know, individual, and then the absence of a capable guardian. So every day, these kids that we work with, they go to school with capable guardians. They go to school with you all. You know, you are there watching them, looking out for them, noticing behavioral changes, noticing, you know, um, comments that kids make, and then you're there to intervene. We're mandated reporters. So now we've lo we're losing that uh, ability to a degree. I know there are some of you guys out there that are able to communicate directly either through audio, through the phone or through video, 
um, to connect with kids. So um, we have to, as much as possible, you know, continue those efforts because um, research shows us that um, that that children who are um, at risk uh, are at uh, we begin when we when we're involved with kids who are who are at risk, we begin to become a safety factor. So the more that we're involved, the less likely um, a caregiver is to hurt their child. Um, and we we have some some seriously stressful situations coming up with financial stressors and especially in communities where they're not used to financial stressors, the stressors are going to become much greater and people are going to turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms and such as alcohol and drugs, you know, to try to um, uh, medicate themselves. And we will see uh, children in greater risk over the next uh, days and weeks to come. There's also people who have to go to work, you know, and there's still places like food service that are open. And, and those kids, I think, um, are the children of those people are going to uh, be at greater risk as they're looking for supervision for their child. Or they may either leave their children at home alone, or they may be look, leaving them with somebody who they um, who who may not be a preferred, you know, trusted caregiver. And so we end up with situations where children are in more vulnerable positions in a crisis like this. Go ahead, Peg. Okay, so some what are some things that we should do? You know, like I said in an earlier slide, we should be showing empathy. We should be clear in communications. And now it's hard to be clear when the situation is, is organic and evolving, but we wanna be as clear as possible. And we wanna be honest. We never lie to people, um, we, but we do reveal information in a developmentally appropriate way. So you say things differently to younger children than you would to older children. But whenever you're gonna suggest something, you wanna be, uh, be confident that what you're saying is correct, it's accurate information. So be sure you educate yourself on on what resources are available and what can be there to support people. Now, one of the key things that I hope that you'll take away today is, that, is to remember that action binds anxiety. So anxiety splinters a person in different directions, but action brings it all together. So you wanna kind of think of ways that you can get people to, to do something. Now, oftentimes when people are healthy, they wanna help and we're seeing that all over the nation. It's beautiful. We're seeing people who are taking action and so they're probably looking, they're anxious, like, how can I help? I'm healthy, I wanna help. And so they're volunteering to serve meals and to, and to make masks and to do all kinds of things for healthcare workers. So that's healthy for them. We need to think of ways that we can help kids to bind their anxiety too with some action. Go ahead, Peg. Okay, and then some other steps, some things that, that I think are really important is for you to stay calm. You know, if they sense your anxiety, you're gonna escalate their fears. So you're their, you're their rock, you're their, you're their support. And so it's important that even if you're feeling anxiety that you're doing things to, for the self-care, so that when you're there with your students and their families, that you can stay calm during those situations. I said already to validate um, and then give appropriate, developmentally appropriate information. And unification is so critical. Like if a child gets sick or if a parent gets sick, we want as much as possible to, for them to stay connected to each other. So if state and, and, and laws say that they have to be separated during a hospitalization, then we wanna encourage the use of technology to, 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 get, to keep them connected. Kids, kids will, do, uh, will, be, will be in more distress if they're not uh, connected to their parents. And then having a routine. Now, for some kids, you connect. They're, they're going to adapt their own routine, especially if they're higher functioning. But for many other kids, they're going to have a harder time creating a new routine. And so, having parental structure of a new routine is really, I think, very helpful. I think, in general, as a general principle, all kids thrive better when they have a routine. Okay, so distancing for safety. I think this is also, you know, um, very um, critical as well. Now, in play therapy, we talk about, we, we tend to do talk in the metaphor to try to protect kids. So in, instead of talking directly about the problem, we shift gears and try to put it onto a, a stuffed animal or something like that so that the child feels safer when they're talking about what's going on with them. Now, this isn't really a therapeutic approach. So when something's, when something is, 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 um, it, is distressing a child, we really want to be honest with them and straightforward uh, in a developmentally appropriate way. But I think it's also helpful for distancing, a similar parallel would be to um, focus not on the present, like the fears that you have right now, but focus on the bigger picture. So 
for example, if we if we think about a year from now, looking back, what will this have been like? And then and then remind them that historically there have been pandemics and that we have gone through them and we've survived them. And so the, in the bigger picture that we are going to come together and we're going to make it through this. I think it's also to rem to important to remember that that in, in the, as, as Peck said, when we started, we've got disaster and opportunity. That's the crisis, right? So we all know what the disaster is, but what's the opportunity? Encourage people to, to find their own opportunities for growth. Go ahead, Peg. And then lastly, I think uh, until, until Peg uh, takes the next slide, I believe, I wanted to give you a couple of strategies. So uh, doing like very sort of focused on what can you control, um, um, we, we can control keeping ourselves clean. We can control not going out. And then when we have to go out, wearing protective equipment just to make sure that we, that we um, don't expose ourselves. So worrying about it is, is, is not as productive as doing something about it. And that goes back to binding the anxiety. There's things that we can do at home, you know, to kind of keep ourselves uh, uh, grounded, such as meditation and yoga, deep breathing, uh, for those counselors that are working with kids online, I, I, I'm a super big fan of blowing bubbles. Not only is it fun, but it really helps uh, kids to recognize that they, uh, when they blow a, a when they blow a deeper bubble, that their body calms uh, a great a great deal. So, and it's a fun game you can play. You can you, they can have bubbles on their end, and you can have bubbles on your end, and it can help to ground them and to calm them and recognize how their body feels after blowing bubbles. I love that. Um, I really, I really appreciate all those very um, clear and specific um, supports that you gave to um, to us, Gabe. I, I really appreciate this idea of um, anxiety um, action binds us um, after anxiety splits us. And um, my family actually made um, snack bags for the the colleague I was or the neighbor I was telling you about to bring to her colleagues um, at, at the. Um, uh, at the hospitals. So I think being able to do something really helps us. We did it together as a family and that was really important. Um, so what we wanted to invite is sort of um, for your team to think about some questions and Gabe and I um, brainstormed these and there are probably a lot of questions we didn't um, add here, but um, a couple things to think about is, um, and you've probably, you know, given where we are at in this process, you probably have um, already um, address these, some of these, and um, we'd be really interested when we open it up for comment um, for people to share what they've done. But, you know, we're interested in thinking about how will risk assessment protocols be amended so that students are, who are in distress are best supported. I know that surveys are going home. I know that some districts that have screening um, data are looking at, at kids that were elevated before um, the crisis. Um, and then how are we working with local law enforcement to conduct welfare checks on students and families given our, our social justice, our social uh, distancing mandates? Um, so, so, you know, what is the SRO part of your conversation? What are the things that you're doing um, to support? How do we, we're still mandated reporters. Um, so if we have a concern about a child, I know some schools, um, they They've done some, you know, home visits where the young person comes out on the front porch and there's six foot distance. But what are what are you doing to sort of do those welfare checks, especially when these numbers get get larger, um, the number of students that we're concerned about? Um, you know, what's the plan? And this is probably already part of your um, of your crisis plan. But are we going to inform when someone, a student or an adult, is severely ill? Um, and then what's our plan for um, for informing? Um, if someone um, loses their life to COVID-19. Um, of course, we're always in touch with families about what, what they want said. Um, uh, so, um, but, but, but beforehand, if we are in a, a situation where we have not lost anyone, um, it's important to have a plan. And again, um, we're, we're so sorry for any districts that have already experienced a loss in their school community and um, certainly hopeful we can learn from, from what has worked for you. Um, but it, we certainly uh, wanna be sensitive and in all ways. Um, in general, it's usually the superintendent that's speaking to the media about the individuals um, that we that we lose to COVID-19. Um, you know, what's the information that's going to be sent out to um, faculty about if you're contacted by the media, what are what are the the superintendents or the board's expectations around that? Um, and then how, um, you know, how will the school-based mental health team, school counselors, school social workers, 
um, school psychologists, um, your whole team, how will we support those students most impacted by these losses? So really understanding, you know, which kids are connected to which kids and, and um, uh, to teachers and, and whatnot. Um, so how do, we, how do we dispatch sort of that tier two level of support? Um, and then we, we've talked a little bit about um, in a conventional school year, when we lose someone, we, we find um, appropriate ways to honor that person. Um, we can't do any of the things that we normally do um, to give comfort in person, to have a vigil. Um, so those are some questions about you know, what we could do. I mentioned the tiered approach. Um, I, I've seen some really good things, some great ideas shared through the Cisco roundtables and on several of the Facebook pages I'm on. But you know, thinking about um, you know the, some of the things that um, Gabe was saying and sort of managing the anxiety of the situation. Um, what are we doing to support all children and families? Some of our kids who have never emerged as having um, mental health needs in this situation might need them. A lot of our kids who um, sort of lean towards perfectionism might need some su some support. Um, so what are we doing for all sorts of, for all the children and families? So are social emotional learning lessons going out? Are we teaching or reteaching coping strategies? Um, I um, was aware of a school that sort of activated their, um, uh, their uh, advisory system. Um, so their advisory groups are, are having meetups. Um, so those kinds of things. Again, what are we doing on tier two for those students who are most impacted by the crisis? And then what are we doing on tier three for students who are exhibiting um, clear mental health issues or um, stand closest to, um, to losses, loss of a parent, um, uh, loss of a sibling, et cetera. Um, so one of our recommendations is um, to um, you know, collaborate with our local law enforcement um, uh, to develop a plan for those um, welfare checks and responding to students in crisis. You know, basically, who can go where we can't go um, if in the event of a crisis? Um, and we talked, when we looked at the map of Connecticut, we talked about um, how we've got varying levels of impact here and can we create some sort of a buddy system um, uh, or think about the current collaborations that we have? Um, who are the folks that you, you are teamed up with for other purposes? Um, I think it's really important um, for us to look at our, our list of staff. Most teachers have made a connection or two or multiple connections and have their, their work friends. Um, new faculty, um, faculty who tend to kind of um, be out on their own, just making sure somebody's checking in um, and that we have an awareness of one another um, and taking care of the adult faculty. Um, and, and certainly our staff, our, our amazing um, cafeteria staff who are out there serving meals, bus drivers who are delivering them. Um, there's lots of people who are activated. Our central office staff, um, uh, you know, our, our um, our administrators in our central office, you know, everybody having a buddy makes a lot of sense. We can get through a lot of things. Likewise, we want to encourage um, families to have a buddy family. Um, we can all think about a family that was fairly new to our community when this, when this happened. We can all think about families that, for whatever reason, don't have a lot of social connections, um, you know, really in ways that we can, um, just making sure maybe some of our PTO parents can make some phone calls just to check in on, um, and say hi um, to families. Um, you know, I think those kinds of efforts to um, make sure everybody feels a sense of community right now. I know um, my town is doing some really nice things uh, for the kids through um, uh, park and recreation and our youth and family services. So are we collaborating with those entities that are keeping our families feeling supported? Um, I think having a buddy system for students is really important. Again, that if we're activating or reactivating our, um, our advisory programs, um, if we are you know, kind of thinking about kids that don't have a lot of connection, um, and then certainly encouraging our students to speak to a caring adult um, and having that, those regular check-ins where um, we are kind of sending out surveys, canvassing who needs our help, who would like a, a return phone call or, or that kind of thing, um, certainly really important right now. Um, I'm encouraging um, our teams to really document both what the crisis was and what the response was so that, you know, that debriefing afterwards is where the learning comes from. And I, I know there's teams that have been activated and already done a lot of things and just 
jotting down a couple things so that when we are in a more relaxed place, we can think about them. Um, I, I really think that some um, some positives are going to come from this um, as good always comes out of bad. Um, we've seen that over and over again in our state. And um, so I, I think it's important for us to kind of have this frame of, um, you know, the two Chinese characters for um, for crisis and opportunity are actually very similar. Um, so we think about um, the things that we can learn. Some of the things that Gabe and I um, sort of um, brainstormed when we were thinking about um, in the event of a loss in your town um, is to um, inform everyone about the loss of a school community member through a predetermined avenue. So is it, it, if the family is open to that being shared, of course, um, but is that going to be through an email? Is it going to be through an update? Um, what, what is the avenue going to be? And um, they should all follow a standard structure um, and be similar in length. Um, so, and um, I think it's always helpful, we were talked about um, having action to take, where can condolences be sent or posted online? Um, you know, school communities that have lots of people picking up meals could maybe um, think about, is there a safe way for people to drop off condolence cards or that kind of thing? Um, could we look at online vigils um, uh, so that there's an opportunity or, or state a date in the future where it's gonna be safe to assemble? Um, I think it's most important, as we said earlier, to identify the community members who are most impacted by the loss and offer that, that grief counseling. If telehealth is something your district is doing, um, we always hear on the news when there's a crisis, there are crisis counselors that are being made available. And how do we do that? How do we kind of set ourselves up for that? Um, and then to continue to check in with those who have lost a family member, a friend, or a coworker, just keeping our, our um, support systems very active. Um, and then I think providing clear and consistent avenues for school community members to express their grief and, and send condolences. And I've, we've got an idea we're gonna share in a moment about um, uh, an online um, memorial page but thinking about um, how we're going to manage that and keep it when in a, in a time where we might be experiencing multiple losses, unfortunately, how do we, how do we manage that? We're going to continue to discourage in-person gatherings um, uh, until it's safe to do so. Um, we can think about um, budding up with the other districts, as I mentioned, or outside agencies that are familiar with our school community. Um, we're going to put our oxygen masks on, we're going to give care to the caregivers, we're going to give respite whenever we can, um, and debrief. So some of those things were, were mentioned elsewhere in the, um, in the presentation. When we think about grief and loss, and this is the hardest part of this whole situation, is, is how do we handle this? We have to find healthy ways to begin um, the healing process. And um, I think that we have an important opportunity here to model how to stay calm, how to manage our anxiety. We have an opportunity here to model collaboration, um, to model support. Um, unfortunately, we're, we may have the opportunity also to model, or some of our communities are already having the opportunity to, to model um, uh, healthy grieving. Um, so one of the ideas we had, and I'm gonna ask Ashley Motinia to um, un unmute herself, because in a moment she's gonna, sh I, I asked her, she's a former student, an awesome school counselor, um, in Waterbury um, and talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, sort of how we put together um, a potential memory wall that would be moderated by student support team where, where people could um, share an idea. I made this, um, I made this as, a, as a potential sample of, you know, what it might look like. Um, and so any posting would go through a school counselor or a student support team member. And then people would have a chance to write something um, and, you know, we could have this clearly, you know, available for a period of time and, and, you know, change that around, but giving people a place to voice is, of course, having um, uh, the permission of the family. So, Ashley, are you with us? I'm here. All right, Ashley, you go for it. These are your two slides on how to create a memory wall through Google Classroom. So... Dr. Donahue uh, messaged me because I had just posted how for the first time I created a Google Classroom. Um, teachers in my districts had been, have been using it. Um, I know there's also Schoology. I know Region 16 uses Schoology. They're essentially just kind of social media type pages. Um, so I made one. I'm the freshman counselor, so I have class of 2023. Um, so it's just kind of how you can create a Google Classroom so that there can be 
you can kind of use that to create a memorial page if need be. Um, and it's fairly simple to use. Um, first, get the family's permission that, you, that you're creating something like this, let them know. And then you can create, click the little waffle icon. That's what, when I was in um, Prospect, that's what they called it. It's just the little squares. Mm -hmm. So um, I still call it the waffle. Um, and using your educator account, you can add students to the class. So you click create class and um, your pop up as a teacher. And then there's next to students, it'll say there's a little person with a little plus sign and you can add your students. I went through when I made mine and I added all 260 of my kids myself because it's, it was easier for me to do that than to have them do it themselves. Otherwise, you can um, give them a class code that they can use, that they can then use that to log in themselves. And you can also invite staff members to either join as another administrator or as a kind of student in the class. Next slide, Dr. Donnie. Um, so just some tips. These are just little snapshots I took of mine that I did. Um, I got this from one of the um, other Cisco roundtables is I put a picture of myself because otherwise usually it's just um, we're the eagle. So I usually just have an eagle. Um, but this way my kids can see my face and know it's me that's talking to them. Um, but it works very similarly to a Facebook or social media page with the moderator. Um, be consistent, have a policy. So I, on Friday, posted kind of like a have a good weekend. And I let my kids know, I'm not checking this over the weekend, kind of for that self-care piece for myself. Um, I kind of lied. I did check it, but I didn't respond. <laughs> Um, but just to kind of have that kind of separation and so that they knew like they can do stuff, but that they're not necessarily going to be, be able to contact me as easily over the weekend. I um, should jump in. That's also like being consistent, have a policy about the, about the memorial page too. Um, I think your policy is awesome and important to have around your page, but I think also having, um, a, a consistent policy about the memorial page, like you know, everybody can post once, everybody can post up to 400 words, um, and that will cycle them through so that someone doesn't have like very little on their page and someone has a lot or people write, you know, kids write a, you know, a, a three, 300 page book to, to someone on, on the page. Definitely. And so when you create your classroom, you can, there's some settings, you can either do it so only you as the administrator as the teacher can post, or you can have it so, and students can comment on your posts or you can have it so anyone can post. Um, that one is going to kind of be about your policy, what you prefer. Do you want to moderate it? Because if you want to moderate it a little easier, having them be able to comment on a post gives you that chance because Google will email you when a student comments. Um, I found out didn't ha I did not have my page where students, um, I had my page where students could comment and I didn't get a notification that my student had commented. I just saw it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you're going to want to kind of play around with. Mm -hmm. um, you can post to the classroom, students can comment publicly. It's visible to the other students as well. They can also comment um, privately to the administrator if there's something they wanted to talk about or something they were concerned about so not everyone knew. Mm -hmm. um, you could also then create an assignment. So we're doing scheduling. So my assignment is specific to that, but you can modify it to, you know, feel free to write something, you know, however many words um, mm -hmm. about this person. You can include a picture anything like that. And then it'll pop up in this assignment page as well. Mm -hmm. And then it just helps you create that page. So staff, students can come together um, and just kind of help with the healing during this, this time that's just so uncertain. Thank you so much, Ashley. She was my A++ student, one of many. So thank you so much, Ashley. Hey, hey. Yeah. I just wanted to comment also. So Ashley, that's really great. I, th um, I wanted to just point out real quick that I, um, I'm, you know, I'm pretty well connected all over the nation to crisis teams um, in different organizations. I put out a call asking um, some of the national experts about um, virtual, you know, pages for memorial memorializing um, the lost, and they said we're we're breaking new ground. <laughs> so I think that in the next few days and the weeks to come, we are going to see more and more of this. And you know, I just want you guys who are listening to to know that in general. You know, when we have the loss of a student or loss of a faculty member, we, you know, we have to, we should have a policy on memorialization um, because what will happen is you'll have different opinions about memorializing a child. Like you, you could have a child who is lost to an illness, very sad, and, and we want to memorialize that person. 
and then you'll have a child that may be lost to gang activity, to, to criminal activity, and then there's opinions against memorializing that student. So we, we want us to have a policy so that you can go back to a parent and say, this is our universal district policy on this. And you know, benches, trees, they take up physical space, but virtual spaces can be unlimited. Um, so there, it's, it's a nice option. But we have to remember in the same manner that we think about physical memorials, we should think about virtual memorials. Any kind of posting should be monitored and approved. It should be in a secure space. Um, and we shouldn't, um, we should use the district resources. If you are trying to encourage people to post to the funeral homes virtual space or to a Facebook page or something like that, then those can't really be monitored and supervised by district staff and you'll end up having people common inappropriate um, things about the, the lost person and it becomes um, more painful for the family members and for the friends of those who are lost. So um, what Ashley is doing here with her virtual page that's set up through the Google um, Classroom is really phenomenal. Um, I've shared this with some of the national leaders that I'm connected with and they're uh, impressed really. It's, it's a good, great idea, Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. Um, here's a couple of resources we want to share. Um, and you'll again, you'll be getting these slides and you can click on some of these. The Center for School Crisis and Bereavement actually has a webinar that's 25 minutes so that you could set, push that out to all of your teachers um, to take a look at if you, um, if you vet it. Um, and they've got some modules for adults. Um, the Child Mind Institute has put out a lot of good guidance um, with ones that, that's not on here, this list, but um, a, a sample here is um, the National Association of School Psychologists always have really strong um, resources and how to talk to kids. Um, there's a comic for kids. Again, all these links are on here for you. Um, I looked for a couple of books that would be very helpful. I know some school counselors are reading books, uh, taping themselves reading books and sent, pushing those things out. Um, this uh, book, The Invisible String, is not about grief necessarily, but about how we're all still connected. Um, so a, a bunch of folks are using that book right now. Um, and um, so we want to we want to really open this up um, to you all. And um, I think. Um, you know, um, maybe Michelle, you can help us out if you're looking at lots of folks um, uh, here, but we wanna come up with an avenue for people to either um, express a need so that Gabe and I can talk about that or other people can share ideas or for people to share what they have already done. So I, I guess the first question I'll start with the second is, is there a district out there that has um, come together and worked, um, uh, you know, to address a specific crisis or a loss that that wants to kind of give a little bit of um, um, round out sort of what we what we've um, what you've already done um, as far as what's what's been helpful to you as a team. I'm looking to see if there's a, like anybody from the Fairfield County area. I know Vanessa's on the call. Are there any hands raised? I can't see. <laughs> so I don't see any hands raised either. This is Michelle Katusi, but um, if you, if people want to type into the chat, if they have something to share and I can unmute if that helps, um, if that way people feel like they're they don't know when to jump in and take their turn. We can do it that way. There's a lot of folks on here. Michelle, not to put you on the spot, but kind of what's your crisis team um, been doing along these lines so far? Yeah, you know, so I'm at Cheshire um, High School. So um, we really at this point, we're, we're very fortunate that um, it's just seeping into our community right now with any confirmed cases. So we're kind of, uh, uh, ahead of the game and trying to, to plan for what might happen. But we do have a structure in place that was in place when we were in school as our core team, um, which is a weekly opportunity for the school counselors, school social workers, school psychologists, administrators, our SRO, um, our school nurse, uh, representatives from special education that we all meet once a week to, to really talk about you know student needs. Um, and so since we've switched to this remote format, more of our conversation has been about um, kind of just preparing our community and what we might need to do. Um, 
should you know this become something that impacts our community or our school directly so we haven't had to go into action yet i know there's a few people from my district on this call today because i know we're all trying to take those next steps but i do think at least having a set time that we all know we're going to talk to one another has helped great thank you michelle i appreciate that i know everybody's kind of in a planning phase it's sort of unlike um you know preparing for a storm but just a different type of a storm um, and, and having that opportunity to come together. Um, I'm reading from Jason, one counselor at our school in Middletown was using a Google form to collect words of encouragement. So that could be monitored and organized. Good. That's a great idea, Jason. Shout out to Jason, former student. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing I will mention um, that one of my counselors talked about today, again from Cheshire, is if you're not already connected with your um, youth and family services in your town, that they're a wonderful resource right now as well, because they can be a bit more mobile to go out into the community where we may not be able to. Um, and I know, at least in Cheshire, um, they used to have a, a pretty extensive waiting list for counseling for students. But um, because some parents are opting out of the virtual counseling option, like if their kid's doing okay right now, that they are seeing some ability to take on new clients. Um, so I would definitely say if you don't have that connection with your youth services, um, to reach out to them to see how they can be part of your team as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, my crisis team stays connected with um, several state agencies and so, um, when we realized that we couldn't really um, have the ability to deploy, you know, in the, in the event of a loss, uh, I reached out to DCF and, and Demas, and they um, told me that their um, the EMPS mobile crisis is continuing to be active. Uh, DCF is going to continue to go see kids who in, you know who um, have DCF reports, so um, they are trying to vet deeper so that they can limit those um, um, exposures, but they are continuing to do their work. And, uh, and I think that that's a good resource for us as we um, have to reach out and respond to crisis situations is to lean more on mobile crisis you know, when we have those uh, concerns. Mm, kind of, I got my letter done. So I'm seeing um, from Chelsea um, that she works in a small district of about 110 students and even in the month of April, my school struggles to understand my role. So you've created a Google Classroom. That's great. Um, so um, she's looking for some advice about um, only posting once a week and having students um, have something to look forward to every day. Um, so our, our, our Folks putting out some things um, on a regular basis, some coping strategies, some um, things that you're doing. Anybody wanna unmic and share something that they're doing or raise a hand um, uh, that, that's helping? Helping? Can I get on the camera? Yeah, I don't think anybody sees me. It's, sure? There's 175 people. Oh, I just looked right here. Who's on? Your camera's on. Your camera's on. So um, Robin Fox wants to unmic and share what she's doing to help out in, in, um, in her community. Is that? I don't know. She's like a Cisco. Lady. She's a teacher's at some. I am um, working at Westcom. I did not like him. Someone um, has their mic um, unmiked, and um, Robin has the floor. Um, so we're starting our social emotional learning groups online this week in all Saybrook public schools, and we've been regularly teaching the kids mindfulness activities, but also social emotional learning activities that involve improv theater and we've adapted them all to online. So uh, we do uh, games that help kids regulate emotions and be flexible and also um, to connect with each other in uh, ways that exemplify good relationships. And I'm happy to share some of those with people if they would like that resource. Yeah, Robin, we can add that onto that last slide and, um, and w w before we send it off to Michelle, thank you very much. Um, so Sarah Coffey said they created a blog on WordPress and helpful articles and a lighter side page with, um, uh, with laughter images and, and that, lighter images and that kind of thing. That sounds great. Um, Let's see, uh, Amy is saying that they're posting once a week only, but their tips on dealing with stress and anxiety. 
um, jumped into the classrooms a little bit. So people are kind of making their presence known in the classrooms. Um, but, um, you know, can we be teaching some of our school counseling lessons? Um, yeah, that's, that's certainly something that's come up in a lot of these um, Cisco roundtables, um, for sure. Um, are, are there any, um, would anyone like to, um, you know, uh, dip into the chat box or say something that they've done um, as far as meeting with your crisis team and doing some planning? Um, I know I had a good conversation with Todd Dyer to prepare for this um, uh, um, presentation on Friday. Any um, uh, directors of school counseling want to, um, uh, want to weigh in about what you're doing as far as bringing your crisis teams together? Some people. Amy said there's no meetings yet. I just reached out to them. I, I got the feeling when I was talking to Todd and um, Gabe, maybe you want to weigh in on this too, is that the first two weeks of, of the shelter in place have really largely been about, um, you know, moving our whole academic show online. Um, I, my husband is a sixth grade math teacher, so I've witnessed firsthand what that challenge has been like um, for him. And I've moved all my CCSU courses online. Um, so, um, you know, certainly been important for us to be mindful of getting the educational piece up and running and reaching out to those students that are not engaging. Um, so I know we've all been really busy. I know there's been countless 504 and PPT meetings moved online. Um, so it's totally cool if teams have not met yet and, and perhaps, you know, today's conversation is beginning. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'm seeing PD is scheduled for this Thursday to develop a plan for it. Um, uh, we're meeting, uh, um, we have a meeting coming tomorrow, people are saying in the chat box. So that's, this is what's coming up. Yeah, yeah. And Gabe, Gabe and I are happy to be, um, to be resources to teams. Sorry, Gabe, do you want to say something? Uh, well, you had, you had asked me to comment on that. And, and you know, my, you, you've been to my crisis team meeting once before. And so we meet once a month. Um, and when the governor um, called for the uh, canceling of, of, of any kind of congregations of people, we canceled the meeting for March, but we are planning on meeting virtually in April. And um, I know that in New York and in some other states where I'm connected with their crisis teams, they're telling me the same thing. You know, it was sort of, it was new, it was scary. And so people needed to be able just to focus on their families and their, their immediate you know, transitioning of their schools and their classrooms, but I think that crisis teams are going to be back in action online and trying to figure out how to how to how to work in the new virtual world that we're living in now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think um, I just I'll jump in here. This is Todd Dyer. Um, I think the next steps that you provided in the the first uh, few slides really are going to be helpful as we go back to uh, I know the crisis team in Avon looking at how we uh, get ready for a, a potential um, response um, from COVID in our community. Yeah, thanks, Todd. And thank you for being, um, for kind of looking through this, these materials to make sure we were uh, in the right ballpark as far as responding. Um, and uh, I'm hearing from Vanessa that her um, joint, joint leadership team is meeting tomorrow. Um, Deb Ramirez is on the gover governance leadership team, which meets weekly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think now more than ever we need to be, um, you know, gathering with folks who who um, we rely on a right on a regular basis, both in the building and in our community, to really kind of. Um, I, I think about um, when Gabe has done some some trainings where you kind of do a tabletop uh, exercise where you think about if this happens, what will we do? Um, I know there's a school in Brooklyn, um, New York, that lost their principal. I heard about a New Jersey school that lost a 30 year old teacher, um, you know, that you were starting to hear the news stories and, um, you know, how do we mobilize for response? Um, and the, the more we have sort of in, you know, the, the more out in front of things we are, the better. Um, but um, that's certainly something really important for us to be thinking about. Um, yeah. Paula shared Go Noodle has um, th some things you can do um, to help with uh, mindfulness and relaxation. Um, there's definitely a lot of resources out there um, that um, can help kids with that, with coping. Um, so um, Gabe, as far as regional, your regional crisis team, um, 
uh, if people wanted to in Western um, Connecticut um, who are who are already part of that or who would look to join, um, can they reach out to you? Absolutely, yeah. I'm still I'm still here trying to work virtually, so yeah, they can, definitely they can reach out to me and the wider audience here. If you guys have questions, need some uh, consultation, just send me an email and I'll follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um you know through the Cisco leadership and um through um uh, Todd mentioned the um the directors of school counseling um. Uh, roundtables that are already in place. You know, I, I really encourage folks to um, think creatively and and um, you know be systematic of making sure we kind of um, team up and support um, and have a way of putting a word out um, uh, that that more counselors are needed in specific districts. Michelle, can you help us think? Spot, but just you know, if a district is looking for um, additional counselors in the event of something going on, um, what would what would, would you propose um, would be a good way for districts to reach out? Um, you know, I, we don't have any protocol for that in place, but certainly if that is um, a situation um, that people find themselves in, uh, you can reach out to me via email, um, the exec director, Cisca at gmail.com, and we can try and put something together um, you know, to see how, how we can help out. Yeah, that's great. I'm seeing, uh, you know, I, I think that we need to kind of pool our resources and, and think about who can support each other, especially if we're in districts with, you know, with low cases um, and we have available time um, to support. I'm seeing um, uh, Karen is mentioning that she's interested in resources available in Spanish and or Portuguese. I know that, um, that um, the National Association for School Psychologists, many of their um, materials are translated um, to Spanish. Um, I'm thinking about, um, you know, uh, maybe as if, if people are in an are, are available to talk with with kids and families, and you um, you are bilingual, um, you know, maybe that's something a resource that we could start collecting through um, through Cisca. Um, to um, be able to help dispatch. Um, we don't want to get, you know, anybody into an overwhelmed situation, but um, that's something for the board maybe to put their head together on and, and talk about what would that look like? Um, because reaching out to families is important and not all school districts have um, sufficient numbers of, of bilingual folks to help out. Anybody else want to share something that has been helpful to you either for um, identifying kids that are are um, having some mental health needs or for um, uh, reaching out to the teaching staff, anything that you're doing that's been helpful. Gabe, what, what do you recommend as far as you know, checking in on um, maybe faculty members that you're not sure if they have, um, they have connection, um, uh, families that might not have connection. What do you recommend as far as, you know, the, the way to go about that? You mean con families connected to the school? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, we, um, you know, we think about the kids who would swing by your office and pop in and say hello to you every day. You know, we, we and, and then we have kids who are more formal, like maybe on, on IEPs, you know, for counseling or for other social emotional reasons. So we have those kids that are our risk identified kids. And I think those kids need to be at the top of our radar too. Um, and we should be reaching out to them. And so on, on, in my team, I sent an email out um, last week asking them, you know, if and how and in what format are they reaching out? And honestly, it varies quite a bit. And some some school districts are, are uh, not allowing video uh, contact, but others are clearly allowing, you know, their counselors to work, as long as they're working in secure platforms, they are allowing video contact. Um, what I, I heard a pretty creative idea. Um, one of the school counselors in a, one of the Western districts was telling me that um, they were doing what they called screen door checks, where they would uh, go to the home, they were not going into the home, but they would come to the door, they would drop off a gift card to the supermarket, and chat from a distance with the family just to see how things are were going at home and how the family's coping. Um, so 
that there's there's so many different creative ways. Um, and I'll share one more too. The one of the people who told me that she was using video, um, she's having the kids do social emotional activities and scavenger hunts and trying to keep it fun. And then she has everybody who engages and shows some sort of evidence that they're engaging. She picks one randomly and she uh, sends a pizza over on a Friday afternoon to their house. So that Aww. is a huge motivator. It costs her 12 bucks a week and it's a huge motivator to keep kids engaged. I love that. I love that. Uh, Maria shared we have a morning and snack time Zoom chats with the school counselors for any students who want to sign on during those times. I love that. What a great way, Maria, to make yourselves available. Um, I don't know, Maria, if you want to um, unmute yourself and maybe share, like, how how much are kids um, jumping in on that? Okay. Um, so we have just started this last week, and it's, it's been a slow start, but I think we're gradually getting some more. Um, this week I started that we're going to do a Monday. On Mondays, we're going to do Monday meditation. So I'll do a five minute meditation during the snack time. Our snack time is 15 minutes. Um, so we can have five minutes of doing like a meditation or relaxation activity and then talk. Um, on Wednesdays, we're going to do share your pet days because um, I have a therapy hedgehog that used to go into the school. So the kids still want to see him. So he comes on Wednesdays and then. Um, I've encouraged the other kids, which I think will get more kids involved, um, to show their pets. Uh, and then Fridays, I'm gonna think about doing like, what's your plans for the weekend? Like kind of wrap up the week. Um, so I'm guessing where you work with elementary, right? No, no, we're middle school and high school. Middle high school, um, awesome, awesome. So that's great. That's awesome that you've got um, kids jumping in on that. And I think that by having, you know, what Maria is sharing is having this regular check-in time, if, um, unfortunately, your your community, if, if your community experienced a loss, you already have a mechanism set up. Um, mm -hmm. And then we could, you know, you could expand that if the need, if the need arose. Every district has to come up with what's, um, what's the way they would provide. I mean, maybe a question that should have been on our list here, and maybe a question to ask your crisis team is, how will we provide grief counseling? Um, because it's not an option not to do it, <laughs> um, but how and who would be our reinforcements, um, uh, you know, because we will need reinforcements, especially when we ourselves stand so close to the loss. If we lose, um, you know, if, if the scenario is loss of a faculty member, we're standing close to the loss, plus we have to give to the student. Um, so we have to think about, um, you know, what, what is the avenue for giving, um, for giving support um, um, given the current um, constraints. Um, excellent. Virginia's doing coffee, um, hot cocoa with the counselor once a week per grade level. That's awesome. Um, these things start slow and, and you, you pick up, um, pick up um, you know, student involvement. Um, I, I guess one thing I wanted to, to say um, was that, especially living with a high schooler, um, I know for sure that my son is holding out hope that, that school is gonna reconvene for the year. Um, and the conversation um, has happened multiple times in multiple ways. Um, but, but what we've, we've kind of said is we have to be ready for um, the governor to say um, schools in Connecticut will not be returning. He's hinted at it and you know, it, looks, um, you know, it looks like that is the likely choice. Um, and so preparing kids um, around that I think we might be surprised to see, or, or we might see an uptick in needs once that decision is made, just because it's a, another gut punch for them. Um, we didn't bring up the particular needs of seniors, um, you know, kids who are about to graduate, kids who, um, you know, have been kind of working toward this spring of their senior year for a long, long time. And I think it's worth, um, to you know worth sort of bringing up that particular need just because the loss seems you know is very poignant for them and um you know i i was talking with somebody in my own school district because i'm on the safe grad committee and we were just you know sort of problem solving and thinking about things and um she had a great idea she said well what if what if um we set a graduation in you know in august or um, before the kids go to college, we do a send off for them. And even if we met them in small groups and then gave them a mini prom afterwards, and if we couldn't do it in August, we would do it when they were home at Thanksgiving. And if we couldn't do it at Thanksgiving, we would do it for them at Christmas and just have this rolling, you know, um, uh, uh, um, you know, 
date that we are going to celebrate you as soon as it's it's viable and and when you're all home from college so you know i think this idea of how do we support um you know kids where they are and and our kids who are eighth graders finishing middle school that's a big deal too and how do we do um something within our own community that's safe um that supports them um people are talking about you know those drive-by you know, uh, people honking horns for each senior and, you know, in larger school districts, that those things aren't, aren't possible. But I guess I'm wondering if there's anybody that um, as a school community has addressed the needs of um, your senior class um, and, and um, have found some, some support. I, 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 my heart kind of breaks for them. Anybody have something they want to share around that? Uh, Lori said in my town, they have talked about having families drive around a parade the whole community cheers as they drive through so actually having the seniors drive oh because they can drive that's, true. <laughs> that's a cool idea have a little parade of seniors and everybody stands on the end of their lawn anybody else have ideas around that i think this need for validation is really high right now i think we all need to be validated that um what we're dealing is dealing with is difficult um the the positives are that we have our team um our, and uh we have our our, our leaders um to support us and um the resources are there um and i think that we've got to stay positive um uh as best as we can um and and support one another um so i'm hoping that the networks that exist and through cisco we can you know, give folks opportunities to get that additional um, additional help. Okay, Peg. Yeah. There was somebody who commented online that they would like to um, have a template of a letter. So um, I'd be willing to help to work on that. But I just wanted to point out a couple of things to people who are still listening. Um, that when you send a, a message out about a student death that we and don't usually identify the cause of death. We usually just identify, we do identify very specifically the name and grade, you know, in class, things like that of the student, you know, and usually we just call it an un untimely death. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we give instructions like what kind, what kind of memorialization or vigil will be held. So that's where you would, you know, insert your information about how to connect to the Google Classroom, you know, memorial and then, um, the wishes of the family, things like that, you know, the family would like cards or the, the family would like privacy or something like that. So usually it's, um, we're very specific and straightforward. We usually notify the community and that usually comes from a school administrator. They may be looking to you to say, this is so new to me, what do you think? And in, in my opinion, this needs to happen in the same way that we do other deaths. We don't identify the cause of death. We just identify that, that, that there was an untimely death. Yeah, I think that template would be so helpful, Gabe. You know, I, I think that anything that we can do to provide a framework for school counselors and, and for one another right now um, is so important. So we'll attach that with the, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get the PowerPoint out right away, but um, we'll get that to Michelle and she can, she can post it together um, with it. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no uh, just problem. one quick plug, since we are talking about graduation for seniors, if people are not aware, um, for the remainder of this week, we are having grade level roundtables. So um, one for elementary counselors, one for middle school, one for high school, so that those can um, be more geared towards uh, those age group specific topics. So definitely make sure you and your fellow counselors in your district check those out. There's also one for graduate students because this obviously impacts them in a, a very different way. So our counselor educator friends and graduate students feel free to jump on that one as well. Um, those are all listed on the Cisco website and the uh, email will go out later today with some other information um, that will have those links as well. But for those uh, grade level specific conversations, I hope you guys can take advantage of those opportunities that we have coming up. Great. I appreciate that, Michelle. Tanya's pointing out um, it's important to create talking points for support staff members and other staff members so that they know what to say if they are approached. Absolutely. I, I think that having, um, you know, once you come up with your plan, I think communicating it um, to staff or doing a training with staff about, um, you know, how we're going to be managing bereavement um, in this in this um, 
uh, phase of our journey together. Um, you know, I think that's really important and, and everybody being on the same page um, is super, is super important. Um, you know, I want to I want to start um, my thank yous um, here, and then if if other questions come up in the chat box, um, we'll certainly do that. I, I want to um, want to thank Gabe for your expertise and and partnership in this because um, Gabe does a lot of work in this space, um, and um, this is not one of my areas of expertise. But I felt very um, strong about offering something like this through Cisca um, uh, as um, you know the VP for Counselor Education, um, and very thankful that Cisca um, created this platform, and, and certainly um, uh, gives us all of these opportunities um, because I think that um, you know we're all better together when we work together. I know people have left these um, virtual roundtables with um, with a tremendous amount of of um, information and resources, but I think that the sense of community is so important um, and we are really a community um, in, in Connecticut. So I feel very fortunate and to the folks from out of state who, who tuned in, I'm sure you have um, your sense of community too, but um, th this is so important. I wanna thank Todd Dyer for being um, uh, an extra set of eyes on the presentation because he really um, helped me ground it and to Michelle for coordinating it and Eileen for, for all your, your help and to Ashley for um, giving us the, um, the tools to set up um, the Google classrooms and potentially um, memorial pages. Um, that's just a skill set I did not have. So Ashley, thank you so much. And um, you know, I, I'm, I wanna give a shout out to all of my um, CCSU students and thank you for your patience and um, for all the hard work you're doing from the sidelines. and to keep you um, engaged and, and um, we'll, we, we'll need you in the recovery process here. So as you're moving out into your careers. Um, Gabe, I wanna pass the, the baton over to you to say goodbye. And I know Michelle's mentioned um, other Cisco roundtables, so please um, take advantage of them. And I'm praying for everybody. I'm thinking about everybody and I'm sending you warm virtual hugs. So I'll pass it <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Peg, will you start? there's one more slide there at the very end there that I really like. As, as I see people saying goodbye, you know, I thank you all for your attention and, for, and it's been an honor and a privilege. I want you guys to remember to take good care of yourself and, and remember also that, it, that, that is in addition to the virus being contagious, so is kindness, patience, love, enthusiasm, and positive attitude. So don't wait to catch it. Be the carrier of it, okay? Uh, hope you guys, I wish you all well, and, and I'm here to help and, and support in any way that you guys need. So there's my email address, and don't be strangers, be in touch. Mine is there as well. Thank you, Gabe. Bye, everybody. Hi, thank you, Gabe and Peg, so much. And this was a perfect slide to end it with. So, Gabe, I'm glad you had us. <laughs> Fast forward to that next slide. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, we'll hand over the, the sending out of materials to you, but I'll, I will send you the email um, uh, as soon as I log off. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone.